Senior Council and ECP, the Dutch ECP and the IT University of Copenhagen. Um, as some of you might have noticed, there's a, a number two after this workshop, and the reason for this is that we actually had a number one in uh, the IGF in Bali. Uh, and uh, it, that workshop was a little bit different than what we're doing this year. Last year's workshop was, in a sense, uh, addressing the, on a more general level the dominating discourses concerning privacy. Uh, and you could say that what we tried to do last year, and I think we somehow succeeded, was to rebrand privacy. Um, just to recap, I think it's important to talk a little bit about how uh, privacy as a concept has moved between different stages uh, alongside the evolution of the World Wide Web. We've had the early stage where privacy uh, or, and also anonymity was described as this unique opportunity to experiment with identity and challenge under its protection, established forms of power and, uh, and constituted market models. Uh, these, all these discourses are, of course, still very alive. We have a second stage where anonymity and privacy and uh, in general was named and blamed for a lot of things, including being an obstacle to innovation, being a cover for illegal activities, uh, and for that matter, of course, also being an obstacle to everything that is social, open, public, and shared, uh, and also contrasted to innovation. So we're doing something different here. We're calling privacy innovation. Um, now, at what we're addressing here uh, with last year's workshop and this workshop is this third stage that we're moving into. Uh, the one that we are kind of in the heart of right now, pushed forward, of course, by the Snowden revolutions, but also by increasing or changing user patterns over the years. The last couple of years, we increasingly have this kind of demand uh, of users that want to be in control of their data and their information and their social interactions online. Uh, they want to be able to set their own boundaries to create circles of exclusion and inclusion. Um, and so we have, we're addressing a paradigm shift in what we want online as users. Now the last couple of years, and particularly this year, I think that we hear more frequently about uh, services, networks, businesses, new innovations that I directly address privacy. Uh, and data protection and anonymity. And I'm going to mention a few, uh, and I had some are no, more known than others, and the reason I do this is that uh, we hear a lot of company names all the time, but we don't always hear the smaller businesses or d these things. So we have something like Silent Circle, the Dark Mail Alliance, the Indie Phone and the Indie Tech Movement, the Respect Network, Made Safe, Black Phone, Panacoin, Mailpile, New Mailbox, OP, Wicker, Spider Oak, and there are many, many, many more that are directly addressing privacy and user control. Um, and many of these there, of course, build on truly ethical ideas about user privacy and the relation between people and the institutions of society. Uh, others might only just be grabbing the business opportunity and, uh, and, and using the concept for marketing reasons. So part of what we will do today is uh, to try to move beyond seeing privacy purely as a concept uh, and uh, to think of the tools that users are provided to control their social context, their front stage uh, privacy, combine this concept with the, the more hidden layers of the way in which businesses are using data. Um, so to see these two sides of privacy as two obligatory sides of the same coin. Uh, so just to say, practical day. We have very different perspective uh, in, in speakers. We have a very large panel, uh, some with legal expertise, some with very technical expertise, some with direct experiences with working with innovations, privacy innovations. Uh, but the one I want to introduce to you first and foremost is my uh, uh, co-moderator, uh, Bart Schermer, who is from the Leiden University and also is from uh, your... Considerati. Considerati. I just want to say the company correctly. 
uh, a privacy expert in the technical aspects of privacy. I've asked all the speakers we have here today, or at least half of the speakers that we have today, um, the ones that was probably born after 1996, or before 1996, <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm right, uh, um, to uh, talk, uh, to uh, spend two minutes on saying a little bit about what they see as the core obstacle, the, the core issue when you're talking about privacy and innovation. But before that, I would like to introduce to you our youth panel, a panel of some bright young people that are sitting over here. And to make this uh, conversation as close to real life decisions and, and user experiences, I've asked uh, these young people to think of a service, an application, a feature, either one that already exists or something that they could imagine would give them their uh, control of their data and what they do online, empower them. So I don't know if you want to, s with who is ready to be the first one in this? Yes? And sorry, let me introduce your names. Uh, we have Harriet Kempson uh, from the Youth uh, UK, IGF, uh, and Zach De Silva, who is the one sticking up his hand. And we have uh, Nathan Beermond and Pintin Tisha uh, from the Netherlands Youth IGF. I hope I pronounce your names correctly. Yes. And then we have Olivia Bank Bank from the Danish Youth IGF panel. But Zach, you were so brave to stick up your hand first. Um, so yeah, there's like a few general features. So yeah, I'm with ChildNet from the Youth IGF project. But um, we want to kind of focus more on privacy as peers and from one another and not the business aspect really of it. So um, there's really three different things I'd like and that I, the features that I like from social media that I use that somewhat have to do with privacy and using it in a business aspect. Um, I like that, the, I like one service that I really like is direct messaging. So you get that on um, many different services and many different social media. but they also have group messages, so it's good for creating events. If you have a party, uh, any different like social event, then you can create that, and you can kind of chat in a private platform that's not broadcasted to all your friends, just the select few that you can choose. Um, the next big thing that I like to focus on is um, a private kind of service that you use. And the one thing that I really focus on and the one app that I really like to use is uh, called Snapchat. So um, I like doing this, and the whole point of really Snapchat is it's kind of a private, uh, it's a private app because after you send, a, it's all based on photos. So after you send a photo to someone, it deletes itself within a certain time that's less than 10 seconds. So I like that because there's different levels of privacy that you can have within the Snapchat app. So the first level, which is probably the most exclusive, is sending snaps back and forth from one to one person to another. So for example, I could be talking to Harriet and then I could send her a photo, it delete itself within 10 seconds, she'd reply back and forth, etc. Then you can also choose uh, to go like a more kind of, the next level up, a bit more public, when you have Snapchat and you send snaps to a group of people that you can choose from your contacts. So I could Snapchat pretty much everybody in this room or all my, uh, youth peers here, and I could just send them one direct Snapchat there. Then the next level up um, is also, they've got a story feature, which is basically you send it to every single one of your contacts, and it's visible for everybody to see. Uh, another thing with Snapchat, which I really like, is that um, the features within itself are, um, the privacy settings are very good because you can choose if you want everybody to see your snaps, you can choose who can send you snaps, only your friends, the public, and certain contact members that you may have. So the fact that you can choose your privacy when in an easily uh, accessible settings, very great. And then also, even though this is more of a privacy platform, I really like um, uh, public platforms where you can really go and express your ideas. So then the first thing that I think of when I think of a public platform in social media anyway is Twitter. 
So um, I really like this because it's kind of freeing your voice and you can, it's more uh, based around the public perception really. So instead of like different things like Snapchat and Facebook, which are more about your friends, then you kind of now have um, Twitter, which is basically all about the public perception and putting out your ideas and broadcasting it to the public. So I find, I'm sure there's many other apps like Instagram where it's more based on photos that are more public, but Twitter is the one that really sticks out in my mind. So yeah, those are the uh, many different general features that I enjoy using on the internet. Okay, thank you, Sec. So does any of you, yeah? I am Harriet, I'm also with the Child and Youth IGF project. Building upon what Zach says, the thing which um, came up in our discussions when we were preparing for this workshop, that in our experiences, the young people who we know really enjoy having a choice as to whether you can have a private in the, gr in the group Facebook chats or the public platform. So it's that choice which people really like to have features they can choose. A good thing about Facebook is that you can have the private messaging, the direct messaging service, but then you can also post a message to somebody's wall and then all of your friends can see it, or all oh, their friends can see it, I think. And um, that creates a platform where you can directly ask someone a question, but if other people feel irrelevant to them, or that includes them, they can also comment as well. So it's the private, but then public, if people feel that that is a very that's what they want to do. You can also share a post or something you like on Facebook with a specific group of people by p posting it onto a group or by tagging these people so that it isn't cluttering up your wall, but you can share it to the people who you think would appreciate it. And this, because as Zach was saying, I think that in my experience, young people think of privacy as the privacy between peers. Between, so I might want to share something with Olivia, which I wouldn't want Zach to see. And I can do that because you can personalize your settings. So these choices, whether you want something to be public or private, I think is the features which make the choice for privacy, which young people use a lot, and the different platforms are used for different things, as Zach was saying. Thank you, Harriet. Um, Olivia, do you yeah. want to jump straight yeah. into it? Uh, I wasn't told about this, uh, so I just found out. Um, but uh, so I'll focus on the fact is, um, is what's said being private, is it actually really private? Um, because as Zach said, the pictures and statues are being deleted. But that's not correct. That's not correct. They're keeping it in their database, Snapchat who says that the pictures are gone, which they aren't. Um, uh, and uh, I have an uh, incident with my friend. Uh, we were sitting next to each other, uh, writing old Facebook, just because, yeah, it was fun. Then I just saw that I could see her phone number um, in the information. Then I told her because, yeah, she didn't want her phone number to be so everyone could see it. And then uh, we looked in her settings and they stood that it was only her who could see those, those phone number. When I sat just beside her, looking at that phone number. So if, if a company like Facebook, if we can't trust them about what's private, then who, could we trust, then who can we trust then? We have to remember that nothing is free on the internet. If something is free, then you pay with your data instead. So we're always talking about, yeah, I want to be private. Of course, some things I want to be private from Harriet. She does, I don't want her to see everything, but some of it. But maybe I should also think about what do I want to be private from a company like Facebook or a company like Google? Yeah. Thank you, Olivia. So we have the Dutch team. Uh, should we take it from? Yes, of course. Um, I'm Pim uh, with the NOIGF, and uh, where our other panel uh, panel members were more focusing on the uh, front stage end of privacy, I would like to uh, think about uh, privacy as innovation in the in the backstage uh, uh, scene. Because I was uh, when we were discussing and preparing this meeting, I was thinking about a, a service that didn't that doesn't exist now. And that has to do more with the uh, with the backstage privacy of things because we we don't actually we don't have a, a platform yet where you can 
um, uh, like a, a privacy library of, of uh, personal social services, a central place to, rev to review the data that uh, different services uh, have of you, like Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. Uh, you can now actually at, at Twitter you can collect, uh, you can ask for your, the data they have of you, but you can't do that in a central place. So I was thinking about uh, kind of a, a dashboard where you can see what like uh, Facebook, uh, which da uh, data they have from you and uh, which data Twitter has and, uh, has from you, and you can uh, well choose to to share that with. Uh, uh, with other people if you want, or be paid for it by people who need the data, or companies who want to, uh, want the data. And uh, uh, and it would be a service that, that doesn't own all the data itself, but uses the APIs of those different services to, well, just collect them and show them in a, in a way uh, that's understandable and easy uh, to use. And it's, it's probably because uh, we uh, we are interested in this topic, but I think a lot of youngsters aren't actually, and they don't care that much. So it should be uh, as easy as pie to uh, uh, see and and maintain your data and, and see uh, have a nice overview. So that's what I was thinking in the backstage uh, scene. Thank you. So there's only. Uh, <coughs> My name is Nathan, also on the NL IGF. Um, I also on point on the backstage privacy of the cookies. In the Netherlands, we have a cookie law, so every time when we uh, enter a new site, you have to accept uh, about using cookies. Um, when you use cookies, uh, you really don't know which cookies are used of you and uh, where they are sent to. So it's like in, also like Pim said, a sort kind of dashboard. So you see in every site what kinds of cookies you use. You can choose which you use and which you turn off or turn on, like Facebook apps. I really love them because you can choose in, in your own settings which, uh, uh, how do you say, which um, apps you use and which apps you don't use. And every app is like a, a list. You can read a list uh, which function they use of you, your friends, your email addresses, your phone number. And it would be awesome where you can see which cookies, which information of you they collect, and uh, where they, where this uh, information is sent to, which third parties, or just keep in the side to make your experiences at the site better and easier, or are these cookies sent to um, like uh, in, in, uh, a business and they use your cookies for? Advertising on your uh, Google results. So I think this would be uh, nice if this uh, function comes to internet size, and uh, I would really like that. And this one, uh, yes, this is my ID. Well, thank you. Yes. Um, your input is, is extremely important because uh, it's really nice to hear these very practical experiences of what you need. And I mean, you're representative of, uh, of users in general that are asking for choice and more control. One thing that I see in your talk, in, in, in these presentations that you made, is also that some of you are a little bit surprised over the fact that you thought you had privacy, but you feel that you don't really have it. Um, but Let's move on to uh, to the other speakers. I'll introduce you one by one as you speak. And as I said, uh, all of you here has uh, two minutes for an introduction. Afterwards, we'll open up for a discussion in general where everyone in this room can participate. Uh, but I'll just take from the beginning, from where you're sitting. So Aral Balkan is uh, the founder of the Inditech movement and the Indiphone. And uh, please. Hi. Uh, I think it's very difficult to have any sort of meaningful conversation about privacy without understanding, without a doubt, what privacy actually means. Because one of the things that's happened due to the efforts of companies like Google and Facebook is that we have redefined what privacy means. Privacy used to mean for you alone. It is about having the choice of what you want to keep to yourself and what you want to share with others. 
But if you ask Google and Facebook what privacy means, they say, oh, it means just between us, just between you and Google, just between you and Facebook. So in a sense, if you ask Google or Facebook what privacy means, they tell you, in essence, that it means public. So Orwell has a great term for this. He calls it doublethink. So in order to understand what Facebook and Google say when they mean private, we have to engage in doublethink in order to make sense of it. And what, they, what, what we're actually seeing there is a setting on their service, right? When we set something to private on Google or when we set something to private on Facebook, like you guys were saying, it's not really private. It's as private as telling your creepy uncle a message to give to someone else. The creepy uncle in this case is Facebook and Google, who are always going to listen to what you're saying. You think you're having a private conversation, but you're not. There's Google in the middle. You tell Google what you want to tell to your friend. Google tells your friend that, but it takes notes, right? Because why? That's how they make money. It's a very simple thing. There's no conspiracy theory here. You don't need conspiracy theories when you have the simplicity of business models. It is simply their business model to learn as much about you as possible. So we need to reframe the conversation here. We're starting from a point where we're living in the home of a creepy uncle, and we're trying to see how we can best protect people who are forced to live in the homes of creepy uncles who make money by learning as much about them as they can. We need to reframe this conversation so that you have your own home. We can reframe it. We can create technologies that you own and you control, where you're living in your own home. And then you have the option of sharing what you want to share. But you also have private in the sense of private as we have always known it, in the sense of private as it is enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in Article 12, which means for you alone. Thank you. Thank you, Aral. And the next uh, speaker is Gide Stahl, Associate Professor at the IT University. Okay, thank you. Uh, my participation here is uh, more or less based on, uh, oh my God, uh, uh, the research I've been doing in the two e EU project, EU Kids Online and Net Go Mobile. Um, and the, some the surveys we've been doing there, of course, uh, give us, uh, provide us with a kind of overall picture about how much children and, and young people know about privacy settings, what they do, and so on. Although so the diversity is across Europe. Some countries, children are more uh, privacy savvy than in other countries. Older children are better at it than, than others. And actually, those children who go online from various uh, <coughs> devices are very often more um, alert about uh, which privacy issues uh, are at stake. Uh, but when we then go to the interviews, it's very interesting to deep into what the children actually say about their considerations about what privacy is, as we just heard some examples of here, but also what they actually do and what their thoughts are. And uh, one thing is, of course, the personal privacy. I mean, disregarding what is actually going on underneath the, the, the surface. Uh, that children are, of course, aware about what they share with whom and so on in, in order to protect their own privacy. And all of them have heard this story. If you want to get a job when you grow up, you shouldn't share this and that. So this kind of this, well, scary uh, thing going on here. But increasingly, I hear children talk very much about protecting their peers' privacy. So it's more also a collective thing. And I think that's really interesting. That it's not just your own privacy, it's actually something that goes on in so social relationships. And that's one of my points. I think that's definitely something we need to, to build on and, and to take with us. Uh, we also, I mean, we heard about the, all the, uh, uh, some of the technological issues here from the youth panel uh, and so on. And I do think that um, there are, of course, a number of good technical solutions, opportunities out there, but the, the more advanced one, ones and more alternative ones, not that many of the children I've talked to know about them and know the, how to exploit that. And the final thing I would like to, to put forward here is that in the interviews and in general when I talk to children and young people about this, I see this increasing awareness, but also a strange kind of self-censorship that some of the children I'm talking to actually avoid sharing things, putting things up, creating things, 
and exploiting all the opportunities that you have online or in digital context. And I think that's really, uh, it's stupid, I mean, it's crazy, because that actually prevents, it prevents them from all the, the positive opportunities that they actually stop doing things in order to protect their, mm -hmm. their privacy. So we need to find a way of balancing this kind of using the technical opportunities and at also uh, sharing that with children and letting children know that, but also giving them the good advices on how to actually exploit the opportunities. And I can actually see a very good, well, one a very direct thing is actually to having youth ambassadors because what works best is actually to, to share the information and the good inputs uh, between young people themselves. Thank you. Thank you, Gide. And now we have Arda Gergens from uh, the Dutch Senate. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I really liked uh, your comment actually because you can see um, at the youngster there, there are different uh, kinds of privacy, uh, uh, the pers perspectives of privacy. Uh, and that's very interesting to know. Um, also very interesting to know is that you can already see what your cookings are doing on your website. There are uh, programs you can put on so they can see where you how you're tracked and everything. The thing is that there's a lot of uh, pr products or applications out there which we can use, which protects our privacy much better. Um, for instance, a lot of open source uh, software which is made. But the problem is we don't know it. I think th the big problem is if you want to have your privacy protected, you should go to a product which really protects your privacy and that's not actually in, uh, indeed not deleting the photo after so many seconds because we don't know what sh Snapchat does with those pictures. Um, in the Netherlands, uh, recently we were forced uh, as Facebook users on their mobile to use Messenger, uh, which created a big uh, hype between our youngsters because they all said, oh God, you know what Messenger does. He can look at my contacts, he can look at my uh, video, he can take over my SD card. I don't want to use that. And my uh, oldest son told me, mom, what are you talking about? They're all using WhatsApp and WhatsApp can do this exactly the same thing. So it's, it's very weird that they were all talking about this app, which actually does the same thing what WhatsApp already does. Um, if we really want to innovate in privacy, we should actually uh, think the way the people think who are using those applications. And they don't want too much hassle actually to, to change it. We all love to use Facebook. We all like it. There may be some people around here who doesn't want to because you know about privacy. But let's be honest, a lot of people use Facebook because it's a nice application, it's a nice service, you can do a lot of nice things with it. And they're mega big. I think one of the biggest problems we have is that most of those applications come from the more dominated countries, uh, come all actually from Silicon Valley. They don't think about a privacy, they think about uh, going uh, to get rich. And um, okay, it's just like you said, they use your data to make money. So we should actually see how we can put more focus on products who don't have your data to make money, who have different business models, and they are out there. I'll uh, uh, present you one example, which is uh, at this moment being developed in the Netherlands, a local box, which will be an alternative for Dropbox. As you know, Dropbox, you probably say, is conversation between the people who I give access to. It's not. Dropbox uses uh, the data you have. They can do things with it. They can look into it. Uh, this local box is an open source application. It means that we have the many eyeballs rule. People can look at uh, the source code. It's not only encrypted during traffic, but it's already also encrypted at the server itself. So even if somebody would get into your server, it's still encrypted, it's still hard to get. If Apple would have done that with iCloud, we wouldn't have new pictures around now from all the celebrities. Thank you, Ada. And I've actually I ha asked uh, Bart Schermer, although he's also my co-moderator, to, to come with his uh, two minutes points on, on, on this issue. Yes, thank you. And uh, in my role as co-moderator, I will try also to uh, put some things together. Um, the way I see it also from hearing the comments is that if we want uh, really to have privacy as innovation, I think there are three prerequisites that we need before we can actually innovate in the field of privacy. And I think the first one, and it's a little bit off topic for this discussion maybe, although Arda uh, touched upon it, is that we need a international level playing field when it comes to privacy legislation and privacy settings. Um, I'm from Europe, and generally speaking, uh, in Europe, the level of privacy protection is very high. 
Whereas in the United States, where they have a different idea and conception about the notion of privacy, um, you could argue, at least from a European perspective, that the level of privacy protection is lower. Um, but what we see in Europe is all we do is use American services because there is a little, uh, there is a lower barrier for innovation in the United States than there is in Europe with a lot of formal requirements in the field of privacy protection. So a level international playing field uh, would be very helpful. Um, the second, I think, and that's what most of the discussion is about, is uh, we need a real market demand for privacy-friendly services. As it stands, um, there is no real market value in privacy. Everybody wants to have privacy-friendly services, but in practice, everybody flocks to the services that are most privacy-unfriendly because they are very user-friendly and because they are very useful, of course. So I think we need to change the, the, the tone of the debate and maybe move it away from privacy and more towards what is actually happening. Um, Self-censorship, uh, the creepy uncle looking over your shoulder. That is what, really, what is really happening. And that's a lot more uh, tangible than just saying uh, this is a privacy debate and how should you protect personal data, etc. Um, and the third, and I think this is also a very important one, and I'm allowed to say this because I'm a privacy lawyer, uh, keep privacy away from privacy lawyers. Um, <laughs> the debate about privacy and privacy and data protection is too much about what is allowed, what's in the law, how the law should be interpreted. Um, I think the third prerequisite for, uh, for privacy innovation, we need good privacy engineers. We need engineers who can really implement these uh, systems like uh, user-friendly privacy dashboards, uh, uh, user-friendly services that give you real choice and, uh, and access to your data. And currently, uh, the privacy debate is dominated by privacy lawyers and not by people who actually come up with real working solutions. So that would be my uh, three uh, suggestions. So a level playing field, real market, create real market demand for privacy-friendly services, and uh, get more privacy engineers. Thank you. And yes, you are actually addressing this need that you have in there with combining some expertise, which is actually what we are doing today. So hopefully we continue with doing this after this ended. And next on our, uh, on our list is Hanana. Uh, let me, am I pronouncing it? Hanana? Hanan. Hanan. Hushemi from Hivos. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, my microphone is, uh, is working. Well, I'm going to give... Um, I put a twist to this conversation and I'll give a perspective from the Arab region. I mean, you spoke very briefly about the US and the comparison, you know, with the EU. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm living in Holland and I can see that, you know, people are more aware of, of privacy and I, I relate a lot to uh, the cookies, you know, issue in, in Holland and how, you know, your data is tracked and you don't feel really private in the way you know you use the internet um, and sometimes some some websites actually don't work if you don't accept the cookies for some odd reason if you want to load you know material which you know which is quite you know concerning um, in the case of the Middle East I think there is a completely another level of discussion that we should have because it starts from the behavior you know of, of the consumer in the Middle East and how um, you know, consumers are actually compromising their privacy over convenience. For example, in the Middle East, I think uh, most internet users are not very much, you know, concerned with whether their data is being mined, uh, but they actually are more concerned with their card details being stolen, which is very concerning. I can see that there is an increasing level um, of, of, you know, maybe people care a little bit more to protect their privacy. Um, but according to the statistics that I see, it's mainly, um, it's mainly basically people are more concerned if, if um, their accounts, their bank accounts will be hacked rather than actually the government tracking them or the data has been mined by Google or Facebook and so on. There is uh, a need, you know, to increase uh, awareness, you know, about this issue because the more you know, people are less concerned, the more problems we will have in the future. Now, in Europe, definitely, I can see, I mean, I'm really thrilled with, you know, with your input in the, dis in the discussion, and I wish we had the same kind of 
uh, environment where we can exchange experience from people who are actually using the internet. I'm sure you guys, you just want to do your thing and you don't want your parents to know about it, but you happen to share all your information with the creepy uncle. I will borrow that word, you know, from you because it's a really very uh, good uh, description of, um, you know, big company services like Google and, and, and Facebook. Well, due to the high level of uh, hospitality of our, you know, countries, I think they're very happy to host the creepy uncle because, you know, people <laughs> are really mostly concerned with using Facebook rather than just, you know, caring about, you know, what information they're sharing with, with the creepy uncle. So that hospitality thing applies on everything, unfortunately. And I think we should a little bit do more work, you know, to bring the issue to the surface. I know that there are many organizations who are trying to raise awareness about privacy as a prerequisite, you know, you know, now that we know that obviously we're exposed, you know, uh, and the internet exposes everyone. And if you're not very careful, the, the history will haunt you, you know, forever. Because, you know, whenever you have data logged on the servers, it's really difficult thing to erase it completely. In Europe, you have the luxury, you know, to be forgotten because you happen to have a case, for example, against Google and it's working. But even from, if we talk about the legislation side of, it, of, of you know, how, how data has, is being protected in the Middle East, it's not even implemented. So the penal code, the constitution guarantee privacy as a right, but there is no kind of um, track that people can take, um, for example, to to sue Google uh, in, in, in the Middle East because the, uh, the constitution is not, is not, you know, whatever is guaranteed there is not implemented in, in, pract in practicality. And that's why I, I totally agree with you that we should involve more, you know, engineers, you know, people who are engineering a technology to protect the user rather than relying on a legal system because I think it's more efficient and um, it's basically people from the very beginning, and even companies should be actually bound by these specifications. So when they want to sell the products, it has to come with specific privacy settings which will guarantee the privacy of users. Otherwise, nobody, for example, will reach the level where nobody will be using Google, for example, if they don't provide uh, standardized privacy um, requirements. and. I know they've been working very, very hard after the Snowden revelation to, for example, encrypt all their Gmail because they realize that they're going to start losing, you know, the customers. And you know that we all were all here, the product for Google. And basically, the whole business model of, of Google is based on the user. So if they start losing users, it's not going to be in their benefit. Maybe it sounds weird now, you know, that you feel that Google is a giant company and it's not gonna fall down ever but you never know because the future is bleak for these companies if they don't take you know the privacy of the users more seriously because we are noticing like the young generation even you know people that are plucked to the internet at a very young age and I think they are more aware even than for example people who are in the 40s and 50s now about privacy I can see you know from the discussion that they're plugged and they're like on it from now, so I think these big companies have to literally revise a little bit their policies. Now, uh, I know that most of us here don't even probably bother reading the terms and conditions when they want to subscribe to a service. Mm -hmm. um, this is almost a culture, but I don't think that's the future. So we need to rely on technology to help us, you know, gain our privacy back, gain our life back, and, uh, and that's my contribution. Thank you. Um, and we have the last speaker, and then I can see there's some people s uh, sticking up their hands. We'll start the discussion in a little bit, uh, but l uh, let me bring uh, Panette Tranberg from the Danish Business uh, or Ministry of Business and Growth uh, on the table. And then we'll but I'm, I'm talking on behalf of myself, <laughs> because uh, I'm a person who is, um, I want to control my data. I want to decide who knows what about me when. That's privacy to me. That's why I work with a lot of different identities. Uh, for example, I go to fakenamegenerator.com where you can create identities. I block all cookies. I block Facebook from tracking me on other websites. Um, and generally, I, I use Tor, the network where you can browse anonymously. It's a lot of work and it's really annoying. But I want to control my own life, my digital life. Uh, and I can't expect that 
all of us are going to do that in the future. It's too expensive and it's too time consuming. And that's why I want products which and services where it's privacy by default, not tracking by default. So we should all share all these new innovative products um, which are alternatives to the trackers. For example, startpage.com. I bet that nine out of 10 in here, they use Google as a search engine. Try startpage.com. That's a Dutch search engine giving you Google results, but you are complete, they are, are anonymizing you. They won't track everything you're searching for. So there are already now, you can find products and services out there which are alternatives, and we need to promote that. And we need to, that's what I would, in my professional job, I'm working to find ways how to finance all these new products coming up, which is privacy by design. Thank you. Thank you, I, I, sorry to say, are you one of our speakers? No, it's just because we were missing one today and I don't know the face of the <laughs> person. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Yes, well, because now we come to the interesting, even more interesting part, uh, because everyone can participate now, which is our roundtable discussion. Uh, just to recap a little bit, we've been talking about uh, reframing the conversation around privacy. Uh, we've been reusing from yesterday. Uh, we had the, there was the metaphor of the internet as a family member. Today, it's the creepy uncle. <laughs> Um, I also think that one thing that I've heard here that is really important is the effects of not having privacy, the self-censorship that you start seeing among young people, um, and the re request that we somehow have an international level playing field that, uh, that, that we're trying to create here with a combination of expertise that, that is not dominated by one specific type of expertise, but that we actually have some of the technical community here. And then one thing that I also find really, really, really important, which is, is prerequisite to innovating in privacy, it's the market demand and what users need. And users need nice, easy services that are privacy, uh, that has uh, some kind of idea of privacy built into them that we can all uh, agree on. But let's start uh, the roundtable discussion, as said, um, or not the, the table, the discussion in general where everyone can participate. And as said, Bart is here, my co-moderator. We have talked a little bit about some topics that we would like to cover. I see people al already raising their hands. Um, so let's start with the, with the hands that were raised, and you were one of them, sorry. Okay, um, so my question is actually a bit different. So um, I'm interesting whether we really care about our privacy, and by privacy I mean the classical understanding of it. But I, what I want to try, uh, wanna, uh, what I'm trying to say is that we every day we exchange with so many data with each other, and we send thousands, if not millions, of messages every day, and. If I text my friend over there, Teal, uh, something, who cares about it? Who reads and who, who uh, I mean, who is this creepy uncle? I know it's, you call it Google, but in reality, who, who yeah, <laughs> who, who cares about it? And um, I know, I know uh, the creepy uncle is somewhere there, but the data is so big, there is so many messages files, documents uh, being exchanged on a uh, daily basis that I don't think anyone can keep a track of it. And even, um, I don't know if anyone has uh, read um, how much of data was NSA actually possessing of the whole data uh, um, track. So it was only 0.13 something percent. So it's like no one can handle this data. And another thing, um, so uh, what I was trying to say is that we still can have our privacy in this big 
uh, data era, I think. And another thing I, w I want to talk about is that um, our attitude, usually um, I meet these young people that talk about uh, Google, that Google is so bad and uh, Facebook is so bad that they are surveilling us and etc. etc. And at the end they text me on uh, Facebook something and they Google and they, I mean, come on, if you are not okay that someone uh, is uh, reading your messages, let's say, if you believe in that, and uh, surveilling you, that then just don't use it. But if you l uh, like Facebook, I like Facebook, I, l I love all the Google products, I use them, then you should stop saying that and uh, uh, just use it normally. But okay, uh, uh, yeah. thank you. It's so we have to keep the intervention short. Uh um, just to say that, that, that you're addressing something on a on a very general level, and I think we, we have to keep the discussion very practical, but I think uh, to, yes, to respond. Right, thank you for that. And by the way, who are you with? If you could introduce yourself so we know. I'm Anna, I'm from Georgia, I'm on behalf of myself. Okay, great, thank case. you, Anna. Thank you for that uh, question. I think uh, you raised two very important points there. The first one, you said, well, who cares about this data? There's so much of it, they couldn't possibly look at all of it, right? Um, this is not entirely true. Uh, we have algorithms that go through data and they flag certain things. Now, today, for example, you may be sending a message to your friend and through that message, message because of the words that you've used, I understand that you uh, favor people of the same sex. Now, in the country that you live in today, that's not a problem, but that's been flagged and there's data retention. So that data is going to be kept, right? So let's say even in your progressive country, the next election happens and the next election happens and the third election happens and you get a very far right government in and they think that same sex relationships are not okay and let's get those people together and let's have a conversation with them and maybe we can change their minds or you know we can take some action against them. Um, that data has been retained and they will look through that and they will flag up that message that you sent to your friend and say okay well Anna is gay and we're not okay with that let's invite her in for uh, a chat. Right? This has happened in the past, and technology is a multiplier. And technology is progressing at an astronomic rate. We're, we have a logarithmic uh, scale in, in, in which our computing power is increasing. When we get to a point where we have quantum computing, even the stuff that we've encrypted today will be crackable. So if we keep data long enough, even stuff that we think today is encrypted and private, we will be able to crack. Because with quantum computing, we take things that cannot be solved within the lifetime of the universe, and we become able to solve them within linear time. So that's just one uh, aspect of your question. The second one, you said, well, if you don't like these services, don't use it. Which is fine if this business model, the business model of spyware, that Google and Facebook have if this business model itself was not a monopoly on the internet today. I don't want to use Google, so I'm going to use Yahoo. What's Yahoo's business model? Exactly the same thing, to spy on you. I'm not going to use them, I'm, go I'm going to use Snapchat. What's their business model? To spy on you for money, to monetize that data. So once you have a monopoly of a business model, you may not think that Google is a monopoly, you know, I may disagree with that, but the business model itself is a monopoly, so there is no real choice. It, the real choice you're presenting people with is either stop using technology, become a hermit, or be spied on. Okay, thank you. Um, what I would... What I would, uh, yes, um, what I would really like to do is to, um, instead of uh, discussing already existing things and models and the way the world looks right now, I would like to, that we in this se session spend some time on being very concrete on specific principles, specific areas that we think are important in terms of really talking about privacy as innovation. So we uh, we talked about some some areas that we could address, but one thing that I can hear that is coming up is uh, the business models, of course, but also data ownership. Um, if anyone has some input to these specific areas, then that would be good. Do you have? Uh, 
and then we'll yeah. definitely also touching upon the the, the, the the previous intervention is um, why keep using Facebook and uh, the predominant business model being the free uh, business model uh, that's also what I meant with real market demand is we need to uh, change ourselves as consumers is um, taking the metaphor of the creepy uncle uh, the creepy uncle we nobody likes him but he has a very nice house and he has an Xbox in his house and also a PlayStation mm. and uh, he has a big bed and there's always free food in the kitchen and and that is what is happening. These services are, are, are very attractive. They're very good. They're very, uh, um, I really like using them. Um, and still there is uh, a trade-off being made between my privacy and uh, this service. And still it turns out in favor of using the free service. So by changing business models, nobody, uh, maybe you can raise some hands, who is here willing to pay for uh, a social media service that is not free, say 100 euros a year for a service that protects your privacy? Who's willing to pay for that? Yeah, who can yeah. pay that service? Yeah, so that's also, and that's yeah. also a very good, good point, not only the will, but only, uh, not only uh, want to pay, but actually can pay, and it's especially um, for poorer countries, that's of course very, uh, very relevant. Um, I think unless we start changing ourselves as consumers uh, and, and fight the dominant business model of free on the internet, nothing will change because everybody wants to keep uh, using this model. So have you been sitting, no, you go down, have you been pointing? Thank you, Thomas from the German Association of the Digital Economy. Um, so I pretty dislike the idea of, or the idea of creepy uncle because I think it's just saying something uh, what might be might be right, but in a sense is not. Um, yes, we need also as an industry the, the idea of a level playing field for consumers and, and businesses regarding reliability. That we know, okay, if you use a service from US, that this means the same for, uh, like using a service from EU or, or Japan or or or. Um, but on the other hand, if you're talking about privacy and data protection, uh, we've learned from Europe where one very scary thing. We'd like to regulate the use of data, and we're not talking about um, regulating the abuse of data. So we should shift that discussion say, okay, if you're using services like social media or Google services, this means those services are that good because they're using data, and they need data to, uh, to, to offer their services. Google Search, Google Maps, et cetera, et cetera, only works with data. The issue we have also as an industry that we might like with, with the idea of transparency and control, that we say, okay, we've done some mistakes in the past in explaining our business models and saying what we're doing and what we're not doing. Uh, so this also means we need in this discussion some sort of how can we use data? Anonymization, pseudonymization for tracking data, for example. So in, in the end, every month, advertising industry funds services and, uh, and content roughly spoken for about 40 euros. So if you don't use advertising, or if there's no advertising, each consumer has to pay 700 euros or 600 euros a year for content and services. Yeah. So therefore, we need data also to refi refinance our services. And we have to talk about to find ways how to do that without uh, having the image of a spy on. Because it's not economically reasonable uh, to say, I like to read profiles of 1 billion users. So it's just about keyword search algorithms, et cetera, et cetera. So we have to find limitation of of what does it mean, the use of data. Uh, so therefore, I think we need an open dialogue and happy to shift this debate in that direction. Thank you. But uh, yes, last year was actually also about this reframing privacy in the sense that it's not necessarily a box or an obstacle. It's also an innovative way, more human way of using technologies and sharing data. So, but Arda Gergens, yeah, I have you first, and then I have several people down in here. Uh, Yes, but uh, I think you will first. I'll keep it short, because um, I don't agree with Bart. Um, I, I, I'm sorry about that. Uh, let me take, uh, make two points. First of all, yes, we need a level playing field, and I think uh, the IGF, and I said it before, and I'll say it again, I think the IGF should take that role. There are many, many products out there, n n not from only from the States, but from Europe, from Africa, from Asia, which are worth looking at. We just don't know about it, because we don't have the they don't have the big funds to, uh, to launch it. So I think uh, the IGF could be uh, a platform just to, s just to sh make, uh, to share what's out there. Yes. Secondly, the Internet of Things is coming. So uh, this means uh, our privacy will be at stake much more than we think about it. And um, 
uh, what I found is uh, in, in the Netherlands, uh, we have websites who ask personal data on an insecure line. And when I email those people and say, you have insecure line asking social security numbers and everything, and you can't do that, you have to make it uh, secure. They say, well, I thought it was right because I had a website builder build it. What we need is technician who get education at their schools that they need to think about privacy. If you're a website builder and you make a site with social security numbers on it, you should think immediately, whoa, wait, this should be a secure line. They don't even think about it. The technicians should get more involved. And that means that the end users should get involved with the products that they're making. The Internet of Things is all about new innovations and things going on. And they don't think about the end users. They just think about the product. So I think we should uh, uh, make sure that the end users all get together so we can talk with the pr uh, producers of the new innovations and let them see what we want. I couldn't agree more. Uh, and the idea of having the IGF as a, a place where we can at least start some more exchange in this area globally is very good. Um, I saw actually you in the very back uh, have been sitting for a while. Thank you. Uh, I missed the beginning part, but I think I got here on the right time. Uh, is it now? Yeah. Yes. OK. Uh, let me first introduce myself. My name is Sare. I work for the uh, Nas Turkish National Council of Science and Technology. I'm here on behalf of myself, so uh, not talking for my institution. Uh, I'm a computer engineer uh, who is now uh, getting an MA degree in cyber law. So I, I can see both the um, uh, lawyer part and the maybe uh, the technic uh, technical part. It has been suggested twice uh, since I came here that the engineers should uh, sit down around the table and talk about this idea. But I think the first comment uh, made by the miss from Georgia uh, was a good demonstration of the general public view. And this general public view is shared also by the engineers. So if we see engineers ha as innovative people who are trying to make better things, they're like scientists, and their objective is not to uh, be the creepy uncle. They're just trying to find a new, uh, more fun way to um, do something, share something, or um, something innovative. When you talk about privacy to them, uh, they just uh, see that they're uh, starting to be limited. And n I don't think uh, any, I have a lot of, friends who work at Microsoft, Google, and they see me as the paranoid friend <laughs> who's avoiding all the social media because, oh, everyone is watching her. Uh, but uh, they say that, who cares? So, um, and we also talked about the business models. Uh, the engineers are just creating new um, techniques and uh, systems. They don't really care about the outcomes. The, the people who care about the outcomes are the companies who use the data uh, the pr that processes information to sell more products or um, serve some other objects of, uh, objectives of governments or something else. So I personally, I don't think that if there were engineers here who sat around the table, they would, uh, they would just feel uh, more uh, blocked that they won't be able to create more. I think uh, we should find a win-win model for the uh, people who are um, getting a profit out of this system, the monopoly, and try to uh, find a better way that's so that they cannot give up the monopoly by also providing more privacy uh, protective systems. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bart would like to comment on this, and I've seen Olivia at one point with a hand up, a few people here, some in the back down there, so I recognize you, one up there, uh, I, and there, uh, I recognize you, and I'll try to, to be fair. <laughs> yeah, just maybe um, uh, to, to explain a little bit more by saying privacy engineers, I don't necessarily mean uh, technicians. Uh, what I really mean uh, is maybe a person like you who, who combines uh, 
a legal background with a technical background and I think also uh, the business and marketing side is very important. So um, I work for a lot of big companies and currently there is very little incentive within these companies to listen to the privacy officer simply because it's not a requirement demanded by the market. Consumers don't stand up and walk away from the service so then why invest time and money in building it if it's something that apparently consumers don't really care about. So when I'm talking about privacy engineers, I mean uh, actually putting together uh, the business people, the legal people, and the uh, people from the technology side who can build it and can also make it user friendly. So um, a little bit more than just a technician. Yes, thank you. Uh, Olivia has actually had her hand up. I see you second. I don't know if you both of you want to comment in the starting second go after. Uh, you first talked about who cares about the data uh, and um, that we don't care uh, that we're surveillant. surveillant. Yeah, I kind of don't care that somebody is looking over my shoulder. I just want to know about it. And I think that's one of the problems uh, that you have to be really technical and yeah, you have to work with it to know all about how we are being surveilled, how people are looking over our shoulders because yeah, I don't know all of that stuff. And yeah, you can look up that where your cookings are, but then you have to look like at seven pages with words where I don't understand half of it. So if we're gonna build the internet, build on trust, which I think is the best, then you have to, it has to be in a language, you have to put it down in a language so all the children and young people and normal people can actually understand. Yes, in a sec, if you would. Yeah, so kind of on to that point. Um, I, as a young, as a young child, I mean, you kind of don't really realize what could happen, and what the really effects are if you don't have privacy. So that's my big issue. That I mean, I don't know what what really happens with the Facebook. I mean, all I know from my personal experience is that if I go on Facebook, they're gonna have ads designed on maybe a topic that I've looked up or that I've spoken about, but I don't really see kind of more the actual problems that it faces. So I was thinking if the problem is that we don't like have like ways to be private and what is privacy, then like what are the actual solutions to solving it? So there was a few points raised on like money, maybe if the money was the problem that if we, if we have services that really were private but maybe they costed money, that would be the, that would be a one solution. But what about if we had like the actual businesses and we like raised awareness for the actual companies and businesses that maybe don't cost money, but they're built in with the privacy. So maybe if we raised awareness with the, maybe the kids who don't actually know what, who don't actually know and care if they have their privacy or not, if we actually get an interest sparked in them I, and, and like make it relevant to them that, okay, if I don't have my privacy settings on or if, if it's even private, even if you do have the privacy settings on, then this could happen. So I want to go and kind of use this thing now, like the, um, the service you're talking about was the uh, start page. So yeah, so whatever the service that is, maybe kind of boost the credit for that and kind of take away the power from the big monopolies like Google and mm. Facebook. That's a very good point, that you have a default and you don't have to deal with what they're doing, but you should just, things are in order. Um, you have had your hand up the longest, I think, so. <laughs> Thanks, so there are, well, there are two comments I like to make. And um, the first one, I know it's, uh, you don't think it's related about the business model of privacy but it's a lot connected to demand, which I want to talk second about. Try to keep it short though. Um, the first thing is if you want to pay for Facebook, like have a premium Facebook where your data is secure and private, the cost of it, like mentioned, will be like six to 700 euros a month, uh, a year. Could be a month in the future though, because it's based, advertising is based on algorithms. So if you put a cap on that, okay, say Facebook can't earn more than 600 euros from you, Later on, if they s start to get to know you better in the future, they might sell their advertisements way more expensive, and the the the, the value you're getting f uh, from Facebook for free will be even more than 600 euros. But if you think about it, actually, the platforms like Google and Facebook are a very very important part of your life, and right now you're paying phone bills, and they add up to 600 euros a year probably. 
And if you think about it, um, there, there actually is a large demand for the products they're building, but not yet for the privacy. And people would be able and willing to pay 600 euros if they see it as vital as a phone or internet connection. Then secondly, the demand, there is totally no demand yet for great privacy settings um, and uh, good privacy. But the creepy uncles are the ones that are actually um, creating uh, the most demand for privacy right now. The whole story about Facebook Messenger, um, uh, the, uh, you get a pop-up that, that shows you which information you get. This pop-up has been developed by Google on Android, for example, and they use it for their own applications as well. Every little startup, I have to introduce myself. I'm Robert, I'm in the ground troops between startups and engineers uh, building great stuff. Um, all the all the apps and tools that are connecting with Facebook are being asked about, okay, you don't have a privacy policy on your website, you should show it. Um, please be clear about what you're asking from users. And though it doesn't really affect the relationship we have directly with Google, it affects the relationship we have with Google and the third parties and with Facebook and the third parties. And this, in a sense, uh, creates a bigger demand for privacy because we get used to being shown what our information is being used for. And the ones that are actually uh, forcing this are the creepy uncles. And the next stage is that we are starting to demand it from them. And uh, I think the only thing we can do right now is be really open and uh, nice to the creepy uncle and just uh, ask him to be more involved and ask more uh, and create more demand for privacy. Thank you. I'll jump down in the corner down here. Yes? Thank you. Uh, my name is Per Strömbeck. I'm the editor of Netopia.eu. We're a web magazine and think tank on the digital society. And thanks very much for interesting comments uh, this morning. I hear a lot of talk about um, users coming together and a lot of faith in the market forces being able to put pressure on, on the internet giants to fix this. However, in other areas of consumer protection, we rely on authorities. We don't trust the makers of makeup, for example, to do what's best for the consumers. We have inspectors appointed by government to do this. So uh, I think this is the missing piece in this debate. What is the role of government and regulation to protect consumers online? Thank you. And does anyone at of the speakers want to? S yeah. We have. Let's start with Aral. Uh, I, 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 I love your point about that, um, and I think it ties into what you were saying about the pricing of these services as well. Um, when we price those services, we say if you were to pay for it, well, they make 600 euros from your data potentially, so we'd have to price it at that. But that's almost like saying slave owners used to make this much from slaves, so if they were going to you know, stop using slaves, we'd have to compensate them for that somehow, right? <laughs> it's not how it works. Um, but also, uh, if I may, I'd like to steer this a bit back to the original topic, which was innovation. We've mentioned business models several times, and I think that's a key thing to understand. Uh, we've already said that you know this is just one business model. Spying on people for money is just one business model. So if we're going to have other business models, though, we talked about leveling the playing field, and you mentioned that in terms of the EU and the US. I'd like to bring another aspect to this. You have to understand that companies like Facebook and Google are subsidized. They're subsidized by private equity. They're subsidized by venture capital. The only way you can build a free system, a free business, is to support it during that time when it's not making any money. So the free service model really works like this. I have a startup, right? It's the coolest thing to do, right? Everyone loves startups. So I have a startup. And I go to investors, and they say, we'll give you a million pounds for your startup in exchange for a certain percentage of your startup, right? And at that point, I have to tell them how I'm going to exit. Exit. So I'm just starting, but I have to tell them how I'm going to exit. That's how the game works. I either want to exit to sell to people with an IPO or sell to a larger company like Google or Facebook, and that's how they're going to make 10 times their money back. That's the venture capital cycle, right? So from the beginning, I'm thinking about how I'm going to exit. This is part of the myopic nature of this. It's a very short-term cycle. It's very short-term thinking, right? But at that point, I'm locked in. 
So I say to people, come on to my beautiful, lovely, free platform, okay? It'll be great fun. And look at all the things you can do, knowing from the very beginning that I'm going to sell them out at some point, knowing that I need to build as big a group of uh, an audience as possible on my platform because that's what I'm going to sell at the end. Right? So that's one business model. And if we're going to have an alternative to that, how is that going to be subsidized? It cannot be subsidized by venture capital. If it is, it'll just be part of that same cycle. So I think we need to start thinking about how do we support these alternative companies? And that's a crucial, crucial issue here. How do we support them? How do we subsidize those companies so that they won't be forced into that model of exits? Um, I think that's a very good natural bridge to move on to um, maybe uh, the role of, uh, of this group, of this forum and the IGF. So um, looking towards the floor and also looking towards our speakers, what do you think are, are, are crucial steps to take to, to move this issue forward? So to remove it from the level of general discussion and really start taking practical steps towards uh, improving this, also in an international uh, context. You already mentioned uh, the, the, the role of, uh, of, of funding, of uh, venture capitalists. Uh, do you maybe also have already an inkling of a solution in that area? Well, I would urge you to take a look at the Indie Tech Manifesto. If you go to indie.ie forward slash manifesto, that's how we feel this should be moving forward in order to create independent alternatives. And we have a social enterprise in the UK that I founded where we're trying to do that and build a new platform and a new phone, a smartphone, um, where you, you're, in, you're in control and you own it. So you start in your own home and then you decide. We're not trying to protect you from anyone who's in your own home. Um, but I think, look at that manifesto. That's exactly what we're trying to address. I'm inspired by the engineer who is studying you know, law now. It's a really good thing. It's very hard to establish the link between technology and policy. Now, technology is evolving so fast that you know the mind of that little miss sitting that can't comprehend why people don't like Facebook and you know because it doesn't protect their pr privacy um, we, you know reinforcing this notion does not mean we don't want people to use big services like Google and Facebook we just want them to you know these you know smart engineers to start thinking you know a plug in in their brain to consider certain human rights you know um, to be protected, and that's what we need. Now, it's not cool that engineers feel restrict restricted when they have to think about human rights and privacy specifically. So what, what the future, you know, in, in the industry in general should be is that for these companies, big companies, I don't want to focus on Facebook and Google. I, don't, I have nothing against them. I have a Facebook account. I'm cool as well. I have friends all around the world, and I, I, I use it every day. The thing is, what forces Google to have a whole department on freedom of expression? now, you know, because there's a lot of talk about that and they had to, you know, um, basically it's a business company but they have a whole section on, on freedom of expression. So in that section, maybe they will be forced in the future to think more about how they build their applications and products, you know, to cater for guaranteeing privacy rights online. That's what we're talking about. And it's a good thing that we have new bu business models like social businesses. It's a good thing. But we're not bashing, you know, big companies here. We're just trying to, you know, raise kind of uh, the awareness about the issue. If we're going to go down this route, technology, our lives evolve around technology. It's also about the psychology of the user. Because when you have uh, something that is so cool to use and so easy to use, you don't want to lose it. We don't want that either. We just want to protect you and protect your privacy. And we need to make sure that you are aware of that. Now, the majority of people, unfortunately, have the same kind of mentality of that little lady. So, which, which shows me, you know, from my own perspective, from my line of work, that there is a lot of work that needs to be done to raise awareness about, you know, services which mine data and base their whole business model on basically providing a free service in the surface. But in reality, we know that, you know, that data has a, a huge price now. Mm -hmm. So that's my point.
And I'll go to Penelope because I'm sure you have some very practical solutions yeah. to this. I, I just want to say the reason why you can't buy a Facebook login is that Facebook makes more money on you as a free customer than a paid customer. And that's why we really need to, we are only on the first level of creating awareness. We need to understand business models. And there are a lot of new business models coming up, like paid for, for example. But we are also seeing smaller companies now who are trying to deal with your data. If you can trust them, they will take your data and sell the data to some of the com these companies. Because we are paying too high a price for these free services with our data. And that's a problem today. We don't know what is the price. How much is my birthday worth? worth? How much is my, um, my political opinion worth? We don't know. We can only see it's a lot, <laughs> probably. So we need to share, I think in the EU and IGF, we need to share knowledge about these business models, about new services with privacy by default. And we need to make the EU finance some of these new companies coming up. Because in the EU we have a trend or culture where we have more government funding, whereas in the US they have private funding. So the government funding could be used to pave, pave the way for these new companies and services. Um, there's been, you down there have been sitting for a very long time, a few, uh, yeah. Uh, hi, I am uh, E Not from uh, Netwai Ambassador from Hong Kong. So uh, about the new business models, uh, recently I've heard of the uh, softwares uh, installed by private individuals. So uh, that uh, these software can defend uh, traffic surveys, uh, surveillance. Uh, I don't know if you have heard of the hotspot shield and you know softwares like this. So basically, it lets users to. Uh, to to uh, uh, publish websites and other uh, things without needing to reveal the location of, of them, and uh, they can also use them for sh uh, socially sensitive communication. So uh, I think uh, I don't know much about business, but if the software companies uh, that are you know now they are in small scales, but if they can co cooperate with the uh, manufacturers or the t uh, technical uh, industry, to, so together they may make devices that prioritize on protecting users' privacy instead of just how convenient it is or, or how, how nice the system is or how fast the processor is. But I think uh, it's, it's not only the age of high-tech gadgets today, but also products that aims to defend our privacy. But again, it's the problem of the demand. Uh, people need to uh, raise awareness on, on this privacy problem. And I think, uh, yeah, it's ju uh, just an idea of uh, uh, maybe new business models. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see who has been, I think you there have been have your. Thank you. Um, I'm Nevena Rush and I'm coming from a national uh, data protection authority. <coughs> uh, at that uh, speaker reminded me of, um, of an initiative that existed two years ago, uh, brought at the Conference of International Commissioners for Privacy and Personal Data Protection to um, deem every um, uh, web application developer as a data processor. Because um, in itself, every, every application is really processing personal data, so they could be uh, seen as uh, as uh, personal data processors, and that's that's fine if we talk about the European European model, but unfortunately, that's al also hardly feasible because um, usually those appli application or apps developers are young people. They are not even they don't even care about privacy. They just think that uh, their app can could work on each and every uh, and uh, every mobile mobile device. But another perspective is, is instead of uh, pushing the obligations on, on those individuals, because the, they don't need necessarily to be companies eager to make uh, money or to be sold to somebody. It could be a, just a, like a natural person uh, in, in, in his or her, usually his teens. Um, they could, uh, we could 
shift the story and make a privacy by design or by default uh, as an advantage, like we did with cars. So now we're gonna, we, we are like when we are looking uh, to buy a car, we are thinking of a car that is uh, really providing us uh, with some level of safety. So, so this is this is advantage. So we can make a privacy as an advantage, and then we can uh, make a privacy being embedded in this uh, uh, any sort of uh, uh, development, and then it's not an obstacle. Then it's like a challenge. So, so this can be like a positive, positive, positive approach. And so there was, a, there, there was a question, what would be the role of, uh, of government? That would really depend. As you said, I mean, in, European, uh, in, in Europe, governments are really paternalistic. I mean, they really care about their citizens, even though citizens don't care about themselves. So nonetheless, I mean, we are not going to, to allow data transfer to some country just because the government deemed that uh, th those data are not being secured there. And even though you agree, I mean, we would just say no. And it's not the same in other, in other countries. So maybe, maybe we could think of rethinking privacy and also about, okay, we use, we use data as a currency. I mean, the, 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 the freer the service, the more expensive, I mean, the more data we will have to, we will have to provide. But there's also an interesting point uh, often said by Finnish data protection um, um, uh, supervisors saying that there is also right to be silly instead of right to be forgotten. I mean, we do what we do. I mean, and, and okay, somebody could think of us like what we did in high school and then we might not get a job because of that. But, and, uh, and in offline world, there will be only few people that would know about it and other, others would know on the level of gossip. And, and here in online, they would know for, for a fact, right? Dubious. Uh, for a fact that we did something and that we are not eligible for, for a job we are applying for. But the fact is that we are actually the owner of our own data, even though we use them as currency. So that's also, that's also something that, that needs, needs to be changed. Mm -hmm. And what, what you said with, the, with, the, with Facebook, it's actually the trust. So, so we need, if somebody is saying that they're not using our data, we really need to trust them. And if we lose that trust, I mean, it's really difficult to, to, to regain. And we are now facing, I mean, Google or Facebook are the topics just because they lost the trust, I mean, general trust. So perhaps, I mean, be, to, to put it on a more positive side, like use privacy as challenge, innovation, but also, but also market advantage. Mm -hmm. Well, it, there couldn't be a more beautiful end note because this is exactly what the whole workshop is about, is to see privacy as innovation, as an opportunity. Um, and I think uh, we are kind of going to the end now, what I would like would be the speakers to catch up on, on what we've talked about now, each uh, few comments. Uh, but one thing that I'm taking out of this is that I, what I hear a lot is that there's a need for exchange of knowledge. Uh, there's so much knowledge, so many ideas in here on what constitutes privacy as innovation. Um, and I'm wondering if anyone in this room would be interested to continue working this on this exchanging knowledge on a more practical level. Then I think the way we can do it is uh, to send us, the organizers, an email and we'll try to collect and then figure out how we con can continue with this. Uh, because there's a lot of global knowledge uh, on the different services and, and innovations. But let's uh, just start from an end, um, from all the, and then maybe you also want to, to yeah, all right. Um, let me just start by uh, addressing something that Hanan said earlier, um, and respectfully to disagree with you. Um, you said that we have nothing against uh, companies like Google and Facebook, um, and that you know uh, we just want them to change. Of course, getting them to behave better is a laudable goal, and I think something that also needs to be worked on. But I want to very categorically state that uh, personally, I have a lot against these companies. Um, I see the wares, the products of Google and Facebook as malware. And as soon as we start to recognize that they are malware, then we can start protecting ourselves and building alternatives to it that are not malware. Um, and I think that's important to understand. Uh, they don't get a free pass. Expecting Google and Facebook to change 
and act in contrary to their fundamental business model is at best a very naive uh, standpoint to have. Um, they are not going to act in any way that's contrary to their, their business model. They are publicly traded transnational companies that have one mandate to provide quarter-on-quarter -quarter profit growth for their shareholders. If they don't do that, they are legally liable. Their business model is to monetize your data. They're never going to act contrary to that. If they appear to be acting contrary to that, that is called misdirection. It is applied in magic as well. It is to make you feel more comfortable. A product manager for Facebook recently said, today we are looking at privacy as a set of experiences that make you feel more comfortable. More comfortable with what? The fact that you don't actually have privacy. So I think it's a very naive uh, point to, a viewpoint to think that they are going to change and act contrary to their uh, core business model. And to end, um, I just want to say, touch upon what Nathan said about peer privacy. And I think that will also frame how important this issue really is. Because when you use something like Gmail, for example, you're not just making the decision that it's okay for Google to read your private messages, right, and to monetize those. You're also making that decision for everyone who emails you. You're saying it's okay for Google to read all of their messages as well. If you're using a custom domain, they may not even know that Google is going to do that. In this sense, it's like secondhand smoke. The decision doesn't just affect you. It also affects those around you. And if we take this further, it affects democracy, our fundamental freedoms of which privacy is one, and thus it, demo it, it, it affects our democracies going forward. So this is not a trivial issue either. And if we are going to create alternatives, this has come up a few times, they have to be convenient. They have to be great user experiences. We have to actually meet user needs. Nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I wish there was a distributed social network I could use. No one does that ever, right? Apart from maybe a few people who live in their parents' basements with no natural daylight and spend their times in front of a computer with pizza and soda. And I don't like that uh, stereotype either, because that's not what developers and engineers are. We cannot, we have to move beyond allowing engineers and developers and technical people to hide behind, I cannot, I don't want to care about ethics, I don't want to care about the ramifications of what I do, we have to care, because the stuff that we do has a direct influence on fundamental freedoms and on democracy. We have to care. We don't have the luxury of saying, I just want to play with my toys anymore. We don't have that luxury. And if we're going to create alternatives, those alternatives have to be design-led. People wake up and they say, I want to share my photos with my friends, right? Let's build a great solution for that that happens to be private by, by default. We have to do this. We have to build great alternative products, and that's how we're going to win this battle, because it's a battle that's being fought in the consumer market. And I'm, I'm very sure that we can win it, but first we have to understand that there's a problem, and next we have to do something about it. Thank you. Well, a bit difficult to come after that, but uh, I refer to what you were saying because I think you're absolutely right. One of the biggest challenges in creating alternative solutions uh, is actually to meet the user needs and user interests because we all want to be where the others are. We want to make sure that when we communicate, we actually find our friends out there. They find what we are communicating, and that's why well, that was the case with email starting with texting, but also now with the social media and so on, that, that, that's actually one of the conditions. So if we want to create alternatives, it actually needs to meet exactly the same needs uh, that the users have. So, so that is something that we will, will have to, where we also have to listen to, to the users at different levels. I would like to just end by commenting on what our moderators tried to prompt us to talk a little bit about uh, as well, and that's uh, the role of IGF in, in this. And Gry was a little bit uh, uh, mentioning it a little bit uh, just before, uh, because I think we have to remember that as an organization, the Internet Governance Forum is an advisory group for the General Secretary. We don't have any kind of you know, formal role or decision power or something like that. This is my seventh Internet Governance Forum, and I've heard a lot of discussions over the years, and I can see that there, there is progression, but I can also see a lot of redundancy. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. And what is actually very important is what Gru suggested, and that is that we 
make things happen in between the four yes. of us, that we actually take action and we mm. actually make uh, concrete recommendations for the, I mean, higher up in the power structure where it actually matters, where the decision power is and, and where things matter. So at one point that we actually get together and get all these good uh, experiences, good advice, good best practices together in some way or another uh, uh, and, and that somebody actually take charge and, and find the funding because it also costs money. And then at another level we'll actually communicate those good advices and, and, and good insights that, that we share from different stakeholders. Thank you. I'll keep if it short. I, I'll just add yeah. quickly to that and say, as I said before, send us an email and we'll think about how we'll continue and that practically, because I don't want this to end here. I think you should so name the email address then later on so people know where to mail to. Okay, uh, two things. Uh, alternative products, yes, there are out there a lot of alternative products already or are being built, like um, alter alternatives for WhatsApp, which is completely private, etc., etc. We need them to get known, we need to get them out there, and I think the IGF can and have to play a role in that. Uh, second th thing is, we have to get the end user involved. We really need to do that, and to get the end user involved, we have to unite them. Frankly, in this IGF, there is no end user, not in the way I mean. Everybody here is already involved, is already on some sort of level uh, concerned about this problem. The end user is concerned, but doesn't act on it. We need to get the end user involved. We need to ask them, what do I have to do to get you worried about your privacy in the way that I am? And then we know what kind of products we need. Well, a lot has been said already. Uh, I just want to pick up on, on the point that was made about the involvement of governments and the role of regu uh, regulators and uh, legislation. Uh, indeed, I think that is uh, also uh, very important. I also agree with the previous speakers that we cannot uh, uh, just trust market forces to turn out uh, for the better. So there's also definitely a role for, uh, for regulators and government. Um, in the EU, there is a new proposal for a general data protection regulation with massive fines for uh, not uh, complying with uh, the rules on data protection and privacy. While I think that is necessary, I also think we uh, shouldn't put too much faith in the ability of uh, politicians, regulators and lawyers like myself uh, to come up with rules that actually can work in practice. So. Um, while uh, legislation is important, and I think there's also an important role there for the IGF to, to, to take that on a global level and uh, avoid uh, the legislation being split between different countries because um, companies will go to the country with the least resistance and uh, they will leave the countries with the highest uh, levels of privacy protection in law uh, because it ham hampers and hinders them in, in uh, uh, in innovation, so I think there should be a global uh, a consensus and a global level of privacy uh, protection. Uh, but even then, I think we need to have uh, the discussion that we are having here. How can we involve end users? How can we bring together different types of stakeholders, uh, different types of expertise? So uh, technicians, uh, lawyers, uh, business, etc. And together come up with practical solutions uh, for this problem. And I look forward to, uh, to working with, uh, with you on that uh, towards the next IGF uh, next year. Um, yeah, um, we'll just I do quick with Hanana and yes. then Penile, and then I would like the ones that started with ending it, the end users. Yeah, uh, well, I personally have faith in technology and obviously a practical solution is um, alternative enterprises, like you suggested, so social enterprises and establishing an effective uh, regulatory framework even you are advising us not to rely a lot on on regulation because that's uh, probably a long track um, but we have to be realistic as well about what we can achieve um, in terms of finding immediate sol solutions to you know the usage of the current you know um, business models um, I know that social enterprises is a great initiative but um, it's I, thi I think it's a long shot and we have to be in a position to find solutions to 
services that are being used by billions of people all around the world. You can't claim that um, uh, social super, uh, enterprises will replace you know, the services that we're using now. And that's why uh, I think regulation should be definitely um, uh, plugged into the whole process to be more efficient to solve these problems because you know, big companies, they need licenses from governments to be able to operate and they are definitely um, in, a in a position, governments you know, are in a position to put these companies under pressure to abide by specific regulations and here we comes to a practical solution is to plug more policy makers into the technology. The problem that we have now is that the legislator himself or herself are not plugged to the technology, they're not wired um, efficiently and they don't understand the specification of standards, hence they're not able to uh, engineer a policy that is effective to solve these kinds of problems. So I think policy makers need to be more kind of uh, up to gear, you know, when it comes to uh, how we can apply policy to technology. And that's why I think it's very efficient to have engineers as policy makers at some point. If they turn into politicians, you know, at some point in their careers, it would be great. I know it sounds a little bit like a completely different twist, you know, to their career, but that's the only way we can solve these kinds of problems. I will never forget your MP at the European Parliament, Maria, Maria Schaas, she was talking to me when she addresses politicians at the European Union and she mentions servers, they think she's talking about waiters. This is how, you know, the discrepancy is between people who legislate and actually the practical side of it. We have to be realistic, you know, and we need to keep all our objectives within you know, a certain limit to understand that we can't really change the world. We can influence things, and that's a long track also, but we have to be realistic a little bit. Uh, but I would support your alternative social enterprise, no doubt. <laughs> Very, very shortly, I just want to say privacy is going to be so hot. It's so hard to get that everybody will want it in the future. The big question will be, whom can you trust? Because Facebook, Google, every, most big companies will promote themselves on privacy, privacy. So we need to learn how to distinguish whom, who can we trust and whom can't we trust. Thank you, Penele. And I would like, as a very, we're running over time, but uh, let's please, any of the youth panel who would like to come with a final comment. Uh, I see Harriet first. Well, I'm just going to be short, of course. Um, I'm going to move away from the technical side of things because I don't know much about that. I just know with the experience I've had and with my friends. And although lots of us know that Facebook and Google and our emails, they can track us, and we know that th in theory it's bad, I think why people don't, in my experience, do much about it is that we don't know what, why it's bad. We don't know what's wrong with them knowing about it. We don't know what, not what's wrong with them being able to advertise to us. It's a bit creepy that they know exactly the sort of things we like, but it doesn't seem that there's actually much of a danger to it. And with these new social networks, if they're private or these, if new things come about, people are already attached to what they use. People have kind of feel they've invested themselves in Twitter and Facebook and Snapchat. So it w it's hard to change people when they're already set it up, but they already use it. They're already confident in using it and feel comfortable with it. Thank you. And Olivia? So, um, yeah, we I talked about that it was never down there. You talked about it was never gonna be, yeah, total safe and everything. I don't think so either. Um, but we can always we can always hope. And we can always think about, but how can we do it just a little bit better instead of just thinking, yeah, it's never gonna be perfect. So we don't want to do anything about it. Then we have to take a little step, and then it will get better. And then the thing we have to be aware of is just what do they know about us? What do they want to know? What do we want them to know about us? Thank you. Yes, uh, Seth? So um, I'd, I'd like to say, like, as an end user, um, basically my whole point is that I personally, from hearing this and from my own personal experiences, I want to have privacy in everything I do on social media, and I don't want my things coming back to me later on that I say now. So just basically, um, 
like what I'm thinking is what can we do? What can like what can kids our age and things do to focus on getting that in the end? So uh, another point was raised, I think, earlier by someone over there on the panel. They said that um, the first thing we have to do is kind of like raise awareness, basically. So first, I think if you as we were talking about earlier, we kind of want like a practical solution to solving not solving, but helping to better the situation right now. So thinking like, what, what solutions can we do? What, what things can we take? What's the next step in going forward? And then finally having something that um, we can end up making a safer internet and a more private internet. So, yeah. Thank you. And Pim? Yeah, well, the, the last point I would like to make is that um, we youngsters in general, we, we don't care actually about privacy in this time. We don't care. I can say it again. We don't care, and or um, or we don't know. And that's I think the uh, not the first challenge to tackle, but it's think uh, it's something uh, uh, everybody in this room should think about because um, we are your future users, and either we don't know or we don't care about privacy. And if you think about your business models uh, that are not free and are an alternative to uh, what it's now, you should. Uh, maybe think about them without us or um, or maybe with us uh, youngsters and uh, later on come back to us and talk to us and I hope that in the, in the end we will care and we do care. And I'll just already now uh, extend and say that the invitation to continue practically on this work is also to you. So. Thank you. <laughs> and as last, um, is I think it is really handy if look at um, your privacy use for ads. Well, on my timeline, I get ads for parties and festivals, and I like that. I don't like to get ads for new cars or new houses. So when everyone is aware of what uh, kind of privacy they, they give to companies, it could really use for good innovation, but everyone needs to be aware which, um, which privacy they give away. And so when you control it by yourself, it, it would be for really good for innovation, for new apps, advertising, ads, and um, yes, this would be good. Thank you. Thank you, and I would love to continue conversation, but we've passed 15 minutes into lunch, which is a success in itself. See how many people were still here. So, but thank you very much. As I said, um, look at the program and see the moderator's names and get our email. I don't want my email on a transcript, so uh, <laughs> so that's why. But um, you can find us in the program. So please write to us if you feel something for this. Make a little bit of an effort. And I'm sorry, but before we go, can we also give a round of applause to Groove for organizing not just a great panel, but a very diverse panel. <laughs> Because I think it's very important. If we're if we're going to solve the problems of a diverse world, we need we, diversity is essential. So thank you, Gru.